Okay, so we're given this function x over x squared plus 1, and the first thing we're asked to do is compute its derivative. So this should be an easy enough application of the quotient rule. Derivative of the top is just 1 times the bottom x squared plus 1 minus derivative of the bottom looks like 2x times the top is just x all over the bottom squared x squared plus 1 quantity squared or simplifying the top a little bit we have x squared plus 1 minus 2x squared over this ugly quantity x squared plus 1 quantity squared which can be simplified further this x squared minus 2x squared. That's just negative x squared plus 1 over x squared plus 1 squared. And notice this doesn't cancel. This is a 1 minus x squared. This is a 1 plus x squared term down here. These are not the same thing, so they don't cancel any further. But that's the derivative, and that would get you 5 points right away if you came up with that. Now we're asked, OK, I want g to be the derivative of some function. So notice that then g prime that we just bother to compute would be the double derivative of the function. Double derivative right there. So the challenge is, can we graph f if its derivative is given by this and its double derivative is given by that? And hopefully, if you had done problem 3, it would have already whet your appetite. We're looking for the following things. Where is f prime 0? Where is f prime uh, negative? That's where the function f would be decreasing. Where is f prime positive? That's where it would be increasing. Where is f double prime positive? And where is f double prime negative? That would communicate something about the concavity of f. So we want to first start by figuring these things out. And we have formulas for these things, so let's use those formulas. You'll notice that g of x, if we just ask when is this equal to 0, we'd be looking at the equation x over x squared plus 1 equals 0. Well, of course, the denominator can never be 0. And in any case, that wouldn't mean that the thing was 0. It would mean it's undefined. So this only happens when x equals 0. So right away, you know that f prime is 0 only when x is 0. That's the only time x over x squared plus 1 would be 0. What, it, when about, uh, what about when, it, when is f prime negative? Well, again, notice the positive. Uh, sorry, notice the denominator. I'm sorry. Notice the denominator x squared plus 1 is always going to be positive because when you square any number, it's going to be positive. And adding 1 doesn't make it any less positive. So you always have a positive denominator. But depending on whether x itself is positive or negative, you might have a positive or negative numerator. So f prime is negative when x is negative. So for x less than 0. And it's positive when x is positive, when it's greater than 0, just by ex looking at this formula and exploring it a little bit. Now let's deal with the double derivative and try and figure out the signs. Again, you'll notice that the denominator is always positive. You're just squaring a positive number. It's still going to be positive, right? But the numerator, depending on if x is a very large number, might be positive or negative. So that's what we have to worry about, the numerator. Is it positive or negative? So the double derivative will be positive if negative x squared plus 1 is positive, because then you would have a positive numerator and a positive denominator. But that would happen, adding x squared to both sides, when x squared is less than 1. And similarly, if you just reverse inequalities, so that's when f double prime is positive. When is f double prime negative? Well, it would just be when x squared is bigger than 1, because then negative x squared plus 1 would be negative, and you'd have a negative numerator, but a positive denominator. All right, so when do these things happen? Well, let's draw a very quick sketch of what this graph actually looks like. What is the graph of x squared you know, look like? Well, it looks like a parabola. And at the point 1 and at the point negative 1, it hits the point 1, right? X squ 1 squared is 1, so is negative 1 squared. So the graph of the parabola would look something like that. And you'll notice that it's going to be less than 1. x squared is the y, the y coordinate for any given x coordinate. It's going to be less than 1 precisely when we're between negative 1 and 1. And then as soon as we get bigger than 1 or less than negative 1, x squared becomes greater than 1. So this happens when x is between negative 1 and 1. And this happens when x is less than negative 1 or it's bigger than positive 1. All right. All right, so let's keep track of that. So the derivative is positive 
between negative 1 and 1, sorry, x is between negative 1 and 1, and it's negative when either x is less than negative 1 or x is positive, uh, is, is bigger than positive 1. All right, we now have enough information to draw the graph of f. So let's, let's do that. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go figure out where the points of flatness are. Well, there's only one, x equals 0. That's where the, the derivative is going to be 0, which means the graph of f is going to be a little bit flat there. So that's going to happen right here on the x-axis. All right. We also have some interesting shifts. So I'll switch over to green here. We have some interesting shifts that are occurring at negative 1 and 1. So I'll mark those points out too. Say there's negative 1 and there's 1. So we, we've divided this thing into four separate subintervals. And we're going to color code it, and I'll try and remember the color scheme I had in the previous video. When f prime is positive and f double prime is positive, then I will uh, denote that with blue. And this means that f is increasing and it's concave up, so the graph should look something like that. Then I believe, and I'll go over to gray here, I believe when f prime is positive and f double prime is now negative, so it's concave down but it's still increasing, then it should look like that. I think that's gray. Then in black, I have the situation where f prime is negative, but f double prime was positive, concave up but decreasing. So that would look something like that. And then finally, I think I had to switch all the way to orange. And I said, when f prime is negative and f double prime is negative, your concave down and decreasing, you would look like that. Okay, so let's go through and try and figure each of these subintervals out. So for x less than negative 1, f double prime is negative. And f prime is also negative. So here, they're both negative, so I have an, an orange interval all the way up to this first green point. Then there's a change in concavity, right? And, and to the right of negative 1, but to the left of 0, my f double prime is now positive. But my f prime is still negative. So f prime is negative, f double prime is positive. That looks like a black subinterval. So I'm going to go draw this one in black. Now from this red dot to this green dot, between 0 and 1, it looks like my f prime is positive. My f double prime is also positive. So they're both positive. So that's a blue subinterval. And then finally, when f is bigger than positive 1, f double prime is negative. And my f prime is still positive because we're still bigger than 0. So positive f prime, negative f double prime, that looks like a gray subinterval. Since the graph, the axes are already gray, I'll just leave it like that. So let's go in and try and draw this guy. I'll start from the far left here. So I'm starting orange. So I'm going to draw it like this. So we're kind of decreasing. Right? Oops. I'm only decreasing up to where I encountered this first green point. So it looks like this. Now here I experience a change in concavity. I move over to black. That's going to mean that I'm still decreasing, but now the concavity is concave up instead of concave down. So I want to draw a change in concavity. Then I have a point of flatness here at this red point uh, at, this, at x equals 0, right? I have a point of flatness. And then I move over to blue, which is still concave up, but now it's increasing. So you'll notice this means I have a minimum point there. Then I have another shift in concavity. And I switch over to a gray region, which looks like this. So that's starting to be concave down now. So that's more or less what the graph should look like. Of course, uh, we don't know if we've got the right values, but we've got the more or less the, the right feel of the curve. It could be shifted up or down by some value. So that we, we, since we don't know what its actual value is at any point, we can't be more specific than this. But that's more or less how it should look. 